Oh, hey. homework? No, no homework on today? I mean, no, but... Um, so, we, I still have two students from the other section that need to take the test, so I'm not going to be passing those back yet, although the tests are graded and your scores are up on my Notre Dame. Seems like many of us have seen this already. I try to be pretty prompt about getting that stuff done. Um, everybody cool? Okay, probably knew that already. Uh, what we're going to talk about here today is uh, we're going to start Chapter 3. We're talk about Section 3.1 today. So in Section 3.1, what we're going to talk about is graphing sine and cosine functions. So what we're going to start with is just kind of showing you how in practice one would go about graphing the sine function or the cos and the cosine function. This is not a process I'd expect you to repeat as we're doing it. What I'm doing right here, this is just kind of illustrative to show you how this is done. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're essentially just going to plot information from the unit circle as ordered pairs. So if we have the function like f of x equals sine x, the x is our ind independent variable. What is the x in sine x? What kind of quantity is that? That's an angle measure, right? Now, if we're graphing and we're going to plot something, would you rather plot something from like 0 to 6, as in like 0 to 2 pi, or from 0 to 360, which is going to be more convenient to make the tick marks for? 0 to 2 pi, that's way less tick marks. It's only 6 tick marks you really need to put on there, right? If I'm going to 360, i got to put 360 tick marks on there. yuck rooney So typically when we graph a trig function, we're going to graph them in radians because it's less space on the x-axis because it only needs 6 units more or less as opposed to 360 units. Everybody okay with that? And if I have the function f of x equals sine x, the y-coordinate then is the output, essentially the ratio of side lengths or the y-coordinate from a unit circle for that angle. Everybody's okay with that? So the points I'm going to plot, I'm going to take my x-coordinate is going to be the angle measure in radians, and the y-coordinate is going to be the y-coordinate from my unit circle, which is the same as the value for sine of that angle. So my next point would be pi over 6, comma, 1 half. And my next one would be pi over 4. And then we'd have square root 2 over 2, that's 0 0.707 approximately, rather than typing in the square root 2 over 2, I'm just going to like do a numerical approximation. Is everybody okay with what I'm doing so far? You don't get what I'm plotting? So I'm plotting the angle measure, comma, the output for sum. So the first point I did 0, 0, and then I did pi over 6, 1 half, and then pi over 4, root 2 over 2, pi over 3, root 3 over 3, and you're seeing the points come in here on the right. Is everybody okay? So pi over 2, 1, and I'm just going to kind of continue doing this as we go. Yes. What we're graphing is the sine function, right? The sine function is like f of x equals sine x. Is everybody okay with that? And the points for this function are going to be, some of them are going to be just the values from the unit circle. The angle measures my input to the sine function, right? 
and then like if I'm my input is pi over 6 then the output would be sine of pi over 6 which is just the y coordinate from that point on the unit circle everybody's okay with that so the x's are my angle measure and the y coordinate is sine of that angle measure which I'm just pulling from the unit circle and I'm just kind of going through and plugging these in. Uh, so I'm just taking the x coordinate from the unit circle and then the y or the x coordinate is the angle from the unit circle and then the y coordinate is the uh, value for sine of that angle. And we're just going to kind of go until we run out of values on our unit circle. I can make this bigger in just a moment, but I can't look at the table or look at the unit circle and the table at the same time. You know what I mean? And again, what we're doing right here not something that I'd ever ask you to repeat. We'll talk about how we're actually going to go about graphing something in practice in a few minutes. I guess they can. They're not going to let me make that any bigger, it seems like. But this is the point, right? And what's going to happen if I wanted to keep going and extend this graph? I just do another lap around the unit circle, right? And just basically 2 pi plus all of those angle measures, and I just can keep going around and around. So what is this graph going to do? It's going to go on forever, but what's it going to look like? Just going to keep repeating itself over and over and over again, right? A function that repeats itself like this over and over and over again is called a periodic function. And if I actually wanted to graph y equals sine x, that's what it's going to look like. Everybody okay with that? What we've just done? Let's just copy that and we'll drop it in here. Maybe right there. So if I look at this, the simplest version of the sine function is just y equals sine x. We'll call that the parent function. What's the, uh, what's the domain for this going to be? Very good. Can you explain why you know that? goes on forever in both directions. If you think about it, we can take the sine of any angle, right? That was one of the big accomplishments in chapter two, was that we redid our definitions for sine, cosine, tangent, etc., so that any angle could be, we could draw any angle size and found a way to define those trig functions on any angle. Uh, here's a little trickier question. What's the range for this sine function gonna be? <coughs> negative one to one. Should those be brackets or parentheses? Brackets, excellent. Again, what you should be observing is the highest point and the lowest point have y coordinates of negative one and positive one respectively. And they get a bracket because there is a point that has the y coordinate negative one and another point that does have the y coordinate positive one. And then every y value in between is covered by some other point on that function, right? Um, let's take a look at the symmetry here. What do you notice about this? Does this have any symmetry? Uh, it's not symmetric across the x-axis. 
it's symmetric with respect to the origin, right? This is odd symmetry, or if you reflect it across the X and then across the Y, you get exactly. So if I take the right side of the graph, if you reflect it across the X axis, you get this. Everybody agree with that? And if I take that red graph and reflect it across the Y axis, it would be exactly the other side. You guys see that? So that is odd symmetry is what that is. Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Do you guys remember how to prove something has odd symmetry? Yeah, you have to show that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. Yes. How about the continuity? Do you guys see any discontinuities here? Is there any jumps? Any vertical asymptotes? Any removables? So what would we say about the continuity? It's continu continuous everywhere, right? Okay. Now we're going to define a few um, a few terms that we use to describe these wave looking graphs. A wave looking graph is called a sinusoid. So a sinusoid is just a graph that looks like a wave. The first term we're going to define is the midline. So a midline is the horizontal line that divides the graph in half. So I want half of the graph above the midline and half of the graph below the midline. So if I look at this, where's my midline at? The x-axis, right? Because I'll have just as much of the graph above the midline as I would have below the midline. That look good to you guys? Um, the amplitude is the next thing we're going to talk about. The amplitude is the distance from an extrema to the midline. So for example, that distance would be my, or would be an amplitude. Everybody's okay with that? How far is that distance? That's one unit. The amplitude is just a number. Just the distance from an extrema to the midline. So the part in blue that I drew is an example of an amplitude. That distance. Does that look okay? What's another way you could describe the amplitude? Could be half the distance between the two extrema between a max and a min, right? Right, if the max is at one, the min is at negative one, how many units is in between them? Two units. The amplitude should be half of that, which is one. It's the same thing, though, as going from an extrema to the midline. They're both the same, same way of saying, or two different ways of saying the same thing. They're equivalent statements, so you could use them interchangeably. Everybody's okay there? Okay. The next thing we'll talk about is the period. 
So the period is the shortest non-repeating segment of the graph. It's essentially one full cycle of our wave pattern. So for example, let's just pick a place to start at. I'm gonna start here at the origin and go to the right. That's one period in blue. Everybody agree with that? Because after I get to there, I'm gonna to have to start repeating points or repeating, uh, you know, starting a wave back over again. You guys agree? So I did an up and then I did a down and then I'd start with another up that's how I know I'm starting back over again. So how far was that horizontally? We start at zero and we ended at two pi, right? So that's two pi long then. We okay with these definitions? It's the horizontal, it's the length, it's the distance in the x direction for the period. So we start at zero, and we ended here at two pi. So horizontally we went two pi. And no matter where you decided to start and end, that would be your period, right? If we look at this graph, no matter where we started and ended, we'd get the same thing. Everybody agree? Okay. Um, the last term that we're gonna talk about is the frequency. So the frequency is like the number of cycles per one unit on the x-axis. So based on that definition, the frequency is always just one over the period. So in our case, one over two pi. Yes, Rita. Yeah, it's like the number of cycles completed in like one unit. So like one, like from any unit of one length on the x-axis, how many periods get done? Okay. Well, it's just like one of a, one whatever of a period. So like you're doing like one over two pi of a period. It's like a little less than a sixth, right? In one unit, you get done because it takes like six of those about to get to two pi. You know what I? You know what I'm saying? That's all we're saying. Um, so visually, it's not as like easy to see. It doesn't have like a visual representation, but it's like, you know, one is, you know, about here or something. So it's like, what percent of a period is that? Okay, well, it's like one out of the length of the period. So one out of two. All right. Okay, uh, let's do the same thing for cosine now. Where's my guy here? Let's get rid of you. And I'm just gonna go by and, um, edit my points here so that they're representing cosine. Is that okay with you guys? Oh, boogers. All right, I already screwed it up. Trying to do, uh, No. 
Boy, oh boy, Mr. Kulik. Gosh darn it. I got to stop pressing enter, Mr. Kulik. That's what's giving you, causing you all the grief here. Yes. Yes. Oops. All right, what happened here? Oh, I missed one. That's weird. That I didn't catch it, but whatever. There we go. So I did the same thing. There we go. If I gra actually graph cosine, we see it's the exact, fits everything exactly, right? And just like sine, if I kept going around my unit circle, I wanted to, I could keep plotting points as long as I wanted, as many times around as I want to go, or I could reverse direction and get stuff to the left side of the x or the y axis, right? For negative angles, no big deal. Oh boy, that doesn't look very nice. Let's do that. Let me copy a big boy. There we go. And Mr. Kulik, please don't like put it over top of stuff that I need to write or need to see later. Okay. So here's my cosine, and we're going to do the same thing. Yep, the first one was sine. This is my graph of cosine. Before we go, I guess before we start writing this down, if you compare the two, what do you notice? Reverse symmetrical. Well, I would say that they're the same graph. They're just shifted left or right some amount. Everybody agree with that? That the picture is the same if you remove the x and y axis and took away any sense of location? It's the exact same shape, just they've been shifted left or right a little bit. Right? And because it's infinite in the same direction, like it's a periodic function, you could shift it to the right a little bit, or to the left a lot of it, and it would line up. Exactly. Everybody agree with that? Okay. All right. Um, so the domain is, what's the domain here for cosine? Yeah, all real numbers, so negative infinity to positive infinity. And what's the range? Same negative one to one as cos or as sine was. Anybody problem so far? What's the symmetry here? It's not odd. This is even, right? Notice it's a reflection across the y-axis. Remind me again, how do I show something is even? Yeah, that's fine. You can just set it in the opposite order, but it's equality is um, symmetric, so you can, uh, or I should say, uh, yeah, reflexive is the word I'm looking for. That's the math word. So you, yeah, it doesn't matter the order you write it. How about the continuity? 
Yeah, where is it continuous? Yeah, everywhere. There's no discontinuities here. That's correct. Just like just like sine, right? Uh, what's the midline here? Yeah, the x-axis, y equals zero. Mm -hmm. What's the amplitude? Great. What's the period? Two pi. And what's the frequency? One over two pi. Everybody feel good there? So, let's go back to chapter one for a moment. So remember that for a parent function y equals f of x, we can have a resultant function g of x written in this form where the a, c, h, and k control the reflections, dilations, and translations. So we can do the same thing now, talking about the sine and cosine graphs specifically. So instead of writing this twice, one for sine and one for cosine, when it's the exact same thing, I'm just going to write trig there and let trig represent either sine or cosine, whichever one you want to be talking about. Is everybody okay with that? The trig is just the placeholder for the sine function or the cosine function, whichever one you would happen to be using in the problem. So if I take one of these generalized pieces, what's the domain going to be? All real numbers, right? If I stretch this or shrink it or reflect it or translate it, it's not going to change the domain because if it was continuous before, there's none, none of those operations we can do can break a piece off of our function or something and cause a discontinuity. So it just, just, the domain stays the same. Will the range stay the same though? No. Okay. Uh, what actions are gonna change the range? A shrink or stretch in which direction? Uh, Vertically, okay. And what else? Oh, Horizontal stretch or shrink won't necessarily. Shifting which way? Oh, yeah. Up or down, Upward. right? A vertical stretch or vertical shift would change all the y coordinates. Mm -hmm. I said necessarily to the horizontal ones because some functions that have a special kind of symmetry, a horizontal stretch or shrink is the same as a vertical stretch or shrink. But in general, that's not true. But in special cases, it could be. That's why I said not necessarily to the horizontal. All right. So. How does this affect it? The stretch or shrink happens 
Is that a multiplicative or additive? Multiplicative, right? The stretch, the horizontal stretch, or the vertical stretch of shrink multiplies the y coordinate. Pretty agree with that, right? Because we have like. We have this, right? You remember this? Also from section eight. Okay. And the K, the vertical stretcher shrink, or vertical translation, excuse me, is that additive or multiplicative? Additive. Now, What are we going to have here? We had negative 1 was our lower bound before. Oops, that bracket, you dummy. So I'm going to stretch it, but I have to control for whether that a could have been negative or positive, so I just want to take the absolute value of a, and then we're going to shift it up. So if I do k minus the absolute value of a, that's going to be my new lower bound because we've shifted it, K, and then, anyways, whatever. You don't have to, it's just a memorization thing. And then to get the new upper bound is going to be that. We'll do an example, and you can see how that's working in a second. Oh, the range should be a Y there, Mr. Kulik. Yeep! about the amplitude, what's going to change the amplitude? What type of transformation will change the amplitude? Nope. Vertical stretch or shrink. It's going to change how high or low the function gets, right? The amplitude is the distance to the midline, right? So it depends on how high or low that function is. So the amplitude is just going to be absolute value of A. Can the midline change? Yes. yes. What's going to change the midline? Shifting which way? Up or down. Exactly. So the new midline is just going to be Y equals K. If we shift the K units either up or down, the new midline will go from 0 to k. Okay. How about the period? A horizontal stretch or shrink. If you have a special kind of function where horizontal and vertical stretches are the same, yes. Otherwise, no. We'll do some examples to visualize what's going on here in just a second, okay? Uh, and is that horizontal stretch or shrink multiplicative or additive? Multiplicative. And which of the coefficients control the horizontal stretch or shrink? C. And I know C can be positive or negative. So I have the periods of length, so I have to control that. By use just using the absolute value of C. Okay, so this is the piece that really matters more to us than those previous ones because those are really only good for one function, the parent function. These definitions are good for any transformation of sine or cosine. So this is the one that I'd really care about. Let's do some examples, shall we? Where we just practice like figuring out these key statistics, or not statistics, but like descriptors.
All right, so let's say that this is our trans, our resultant function. And we want to give the domain and the range and the midline and the period and the amplitude and frequency and all that jazz that we just described above. What do I need to start by figuring out? I need to know the values for A, C, H, and K. Everybody's cool? What's my value for A? Negative 4, right? Because this is Y equals A times sine of 1 over C, X minus H plus K. So A is negative 4. What's the C? 1 half. So notice that 2 must equal 1 over C. So the reciprocal of 2 must be C. Okay, what's my H? 0. So notice there's nothing in here. And then what's my K? All right, so my domain, all real numbers, that doesn't change, right? Doesn't matter anything else that's going on. What's my range? So it's k minus the absolute value of negative 4, and then k plus the absolute value of negative 4, which would just be negative 3 to 5. Everybody's cool with that? What's my amplitude? Good. The absolute value of A, so that's just 4. What's my midline? Well, it's y equals k, or y equals 1. Will Mr. Kulik mark you wrong if you write 1 instead of y equals 1? Yes, because one of them is the equation for a line. The other is a number. Those are two different things, writing 1 or y equals 1. Very different. Okay, so context matters, right? You tell me what's that line over there, and you say one. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna slap you in the back head and be like, "What are you talking about?" If you say y equals one, I'll be like, "Gotcha." All right. Uh, what do we have? Period. What's the period here? Pi. Very good. So two pi times the absolute value of one half, which is pi. So two pi times the absolute value of c is my period. And then what's my frequency? So 1 over the period, so 1 over pi. Jake? Okay. Absolutely. Let's do another. Well, here, actually, let's, let's take a look at the picture, right? Why not? We have all this fancy graphing software, Mr. Gulick. Let's, uh, let's look at the picture. So here's the original, that's the parent function in yellow. And here's the resultant. You notice that the period got compressed, right? It got stretched out. The midline got shifted up. Does everybody kind of see that? Which is exactly what we'd expect when the values of A, C, and K are changing. That there's been some horizontal compression or dilation. We had a translation up or down. And then a stretch up and down. Or, you know, like a stretch or shrink vertically. Okay. Uh, let's do another. We'll actually do like I think two more of these examples because I think that this is um, 
something that I want to make sure that we can do. Okay. So just like before, first thing we need is the values for. Yep. So it's my value here for A. How about for C? Okay, what's my value for H? Okay, so I've heard three different answers here. Pi, negative pi, and zero. Okay, so what you need to do, the first thing you need to do is write it in the correct form. To be sure, so I would need to factor a negative one out. Everybody see that? So my value for H would be regular pi, not negative, because if you drop, if you say let H equal pi, what would you write? X minus pi. Yes. Once you've written it in that general form, the sign on H will be the opposite of whatever it looks but it has to be written in the general form first. So there, the coefficient on your x has to be 1. You have to factor the coefficient off before you can tell what h is. I think I caught the majority of us still on the last test not doing that when you're coding your value for h. And the value for k should be... Are you zero, right? Because there's no K there. Everybody feel good? Mr. Kula, that was pretty sneaky. Eh, you know, like, all right, we're going to skip writing down the domain because, like, it's always the same, right? We get that. What's the range going to be? Yep. So zero minus absolute value two, zero plus absolute value two. K plus a, or K minus absolute value A, K plus absolute value A. Don't hit her for being right. <laughs> that was <laughs> the amplitude is two. The midline is y equals zero. The period is. Still 2 pi, and the frequency then is 1 over 2 pi. So if we look at the picture then, oops, it's plus, right? Uh, because the value for C was negative 1. So 2 times the absolute value of negative 1 is still 2 oh, pi. Oh, yeah. So if you look at this, what do you notice? Looks a little strange, right? Because if I looked at the values for A, C, H, and K, I would expect a reflection across the x-axis. Do I see that, though? Why not? What has canceled that out somehow? Carmen? It's not the K that did it. It's the C. The C was causing the reflection, right? We're not seeing it because of the because of the horizontal shift. Watch what happens here. If we do y equals two sine of negative x, we get what we'd expect, right? There's my reflection. 
And then if I did y equals sine minus pi, so if I shift it left, it also does the same thing. Do you guys see that? Or shift it right, excuse me. So shifting right by pi and reflecting across the y-axis did the same thing. So if I do both of them at the same time, that's like doing nothing at all, right? It's like doing a reflect it and reflect it again, which did nothing at all. That's why the orange one, we can't see the reflection because the translation did the same thing. So they like undid each other. Ooh, Mr. Gulag, that is pretty sneaky. That really is only going to happen for these periodic functions where a translation can do the same thing as a reflection. But that's a nice example of like a situation where you look at the picture and you get the wrong impression of what happened, right? All right, so just like before, need those values for A, C, H, and K. A is, C is, two, the reciprocal of the coefficient. H is, Nope. 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 What? I have to factor the one half out. H is six pi. I have to factor that one half off so the coefficient of x is one before I can tell what the h is. Uh, Mr. Kulik, am I going to screw that up? Probably a couple of times, but we'll do enough practice and you'll get enough stuff wrong in between to help learn that lesson. We're okay, though? We're seeing the... Okay. Uh, what? Because on the first test, I did two times five equals twenty-five. Oh, you're still, so you're still, a, yeah. That whole multiplication thing is tough. Talika, of course. You can go at the same time. It's fine. Yeah. Just in different toilets. <laughs> Just jokes. Oh, okay. What should the range be? No. Oh, yeah, that is. Yeah, there you go. That's more like one. Goodness gracious, I was just taking your word for it. You did. I appreciate that. Amplitude. Carmen? Very good. Uh, the midline? Uh-uh. There you go. Got to have say y equals or Mr. Kulik's going to not count it. What's the period? 4 pi. And the frequency? 1 over 4 pi. Now, how do we feel here? So far, so good? Okay. What if I wanted to graph the above? Nope. We're not going to use the calculator to do it. 
what we're going to use is this map along with some key points. So the question is, which XYs am I going to be transforming? Well, let's give you guys that. Let's talk this first. Oh, where would those be at then? No, that's not one. You know what my least favorite thing about the the least, my least favorite thing about the, uh, the Windows is, this version of Windows, is that it like, uh, when you type a search in, it like wants to open up web page to look for it on the internet rather than look for it on the computer. It's like, no oh man, I don't I'm not doing that. Alright. So these are gonna be the here's a list of the key points that we're gonna be using to do our graphing. Stop talking please. So for sign these are the key points for cosine. These are the key points. We'll talk about the other ones later, maybe. Um, what do you notice that these are the, what key points are these? Yeah, but what ones from the unit circle? Those are just the quadrantal angles, the ones that lie on the x or y axis, right? 0, 0, 90 and 1, 180 and 0. 270, negative 1, 360, 0. They're just the, those five stops. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that. Okay, so We'll just use the key points there, or the reference points from that reference point sheet I just dropped in. Do you have to memorize those? No. No, you do not. Um, so let's do an example. Let's say that we have, we go back to, um, it's now in the content library called reference points. It may not have synced in yet for you. It will be there shortly though. Let's say that we wanted to graph this guy, this one we already did. Right, we already did this for the AH, ACH and K, so I'm not gonna do that again. So my map then that I would construct goes from C times X plus H, A times Y plus K. And so the key points for sign that I would be using are these.
Everybody's okay with what I've drawn there? So these guys, I just would have pulled from the reference point sheet. Mr. Kulik hasn't memorized because he's been teaching this same stuff for 15 years and like you eventually just memorize it because you do it a trillion times, multiple times a day for 15 years. You just kind of memorize this stuff. That's why I look so good at this. And yes, like I'm better at math than you are also, but I've also done this so many times that it's like really pretty trivial for me which is fine, right? Like that's why it looks, that's what it looks like when you're a teacher. So if I wanted to plot these points now, let's do that. That seems fine. Just gonna steal this guy as my graph paper. So I'm going to have the point zero one pi over four negative three would be right about there, like halfway in between. Pi over two and one. Three pi over four is like three quarters, so it's like right there, and then up to five, and then pi one. So all I've done here is graph one period of my function. Mr. Kulik's graphing directions on anything you do are, is going to be fill the space provided. So if I give you an x, y axis, is this good enough? No. What do I expect you to do? Keep going with the pattern. So after the first point, I go to a minimum, and then I go back to the midline, and then I go to a maximum, back to the midline, and then to a minimum, back to the midline. So this is like me drawing the rest of that guy. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. So before the midline, I should go to a maximum, and then back to a midline and then down to the minimum, back to the midline, up to a maximum, back to the midline, down to a minimum, back to the midline, up to a maximum, and then back to the midline. Now it looks nice. You could draw them solid, you don't have to dash them, but I figured I would just dash the original period, or draw the original period and put dashes for everything that I just extended. Do you guys get what I'm doing there when I do the extension? I'm not actually finding any more points, I'm just like following the pattern. Because like who has time for generating like that many more points and grinding them through that formula? No thank you. That's the point of a periodic function is it just repeats. So just keep repeating the pattern. What do you guys think? This feels pretty good, hopefully, right? All right. Um, I got some stuff for you to work on then. We're going to ask you guys to do um, in the homework set... What do we got? Um, 1 through 12. But I also want you to do uh, worksheet 1. Yeah, that's a good one. And that's it. Yep. Yeah, on my desk. Would you like to borrow one? Of course. Thank you.
Yes. We'll, we'll stop here for today. That's good enough. The next thing is a whole big old can of worms. I don't want to start in 15 minutes left. So plus the next class tomorrow, I'm going to be 15 minutes short on. So it feels like a good time to stop. Because there's mass tomorrow. Wear your uniform.